Good morning and welcome to, to Reedville this morning. Um, just a few announcements I'd like to direct your attention to um, in the bulletins. Uh, just a reminder of the lunch afterward. Uh, please stay and it will be a good time of food and fellowship. Um, also, uh, Bible study. Third announcement is just remember the Easter egg hunt on Saturday, April 1st from 1 to, to 3. Um, Lord willing, it'll not rain and that it'll be a good time of community and fellowship and, and the like that you can uh, certainly invite others as well. One announcement I did not put into uh, the bulletin is the Lord's Supper will be observed next week by uh, and it will be administered and the service will be preached by Jeff Early from Second Pres. Um, so do be in prayer for him this week and also in preparing our own hearts for that. Uh, Lord's Supper as well. well. With all those things in mind, I just ask that we take a moment to prepare our hearts in silent prayer. Let's pray together. Congregation of the Lord Jesus, hear the call to worship from Psalm 118, verse 27 to 29. The Lord is God, and he has made his light to shine upon us. Bind the festal sacrifice with cords up to the horns of the altar. You are my God, and I will give thanks to you. You are my God, I will extol you. O oh, give thanks to the Lord, for he is good, for his steadfast love endures forever. Let us pray. Heavenly Father, let the light of your steadfast love shine upon us today. Help us remember today that as you bring us from death to life, we stand in the gospel of the Lord Jesus Christ, a gospel of love, mercy, and grace. Teach us what you would have us to learn, 
and grant us the insight from your word to enable us to live in a free and contrite manner. Give us this grace and help, we pray, even as you taught your own to pray, saying, Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory forever. Amen. Our opening hymn is Hymn 115 in the Trinity Hymnal. All creatures of our God and King will sing the first two and the last two verses of that hymn, hymn 115. Sing with me as we sing. you to turn in the uh, your Trinity hymnals as well to page 869 and 870 as we look at uh, our catechism this week um, from the Westminster Shorter Catechism number 87 and part of that is because the questions on one page and then the answers on the, the other but it reads as this what are the decrees of God and he answers uh, those decrees there uh, there in the uh, on page 870 basically it highlights here by when it says his eternal purpose according to the counsel of his own will has foreordained whatsoever comes to pass. Now, a lot of the times when we think about um, that God controls all things, that God speaks all things into existence, that he controls all our, controls our actions, he plans out our steps, sometimes that can be a little uh, uncomfortable to some. 
But it shows us, at least at some level, that God is not disinterested in our lives. On the one hand, he loves us, he cares for us. He's ordained every step of the way for your life. He, through all the pain and all the struggles, he knows that it's coming. He ordained it. And for those who love him, he works all things together for good, for those who love him. And so in, one, in a very important way, these truths should comfort us that God leads us, he guides us and directs us, because it falls under his perfect plan from before the found, very foundation of the world. So in that spirit then, in question number seven, uh, Church of God, what are the decrees of God? The decrees of God are his eternal purpose, according to the counsel of his will, whereby for his own glory he hath foreordained whatsoever comes to pass. Amen. I'd like to now invite uh, Blake and Minda to take up this morning's tithes and offerings. Heavenly Father, we thank you for the many ways in which you bless your church. We thank you particularly for the PCA ministry, Reformed University Fellowship. We thank you for the ways you use these ministers there to bring the gospel to the colleges, particularly of, of uh, Oliver at Wofford and, and Tom at Furman. We pray that you bless their ministries. We ask you to bless their work. We thank you also now for these tithes and offerings and those who give to your church. We pray that you use them for your honor and glory. We ask it all in Jesus' name. Amen. Please be seated. This time we'll uh, have uh, our Old Testament reading in Psalm 32. That's only 11 verses, so we'll, we'll read the whole psalm. Blessed are the forgiven. It comes in, uh, in light of our passage today in Mark 2, which we'll get to in a moment. Psalm 32, verse 1 to 11. Hear now the word of God. Um, Blessed is the one whose transgression is forgiven, whose sin is covered. Blessed is the man against whom the Lord counts no iniquity, and in whose spirit there is no deceit. For when I kept silent, my bones wasted away through my groaning all day long. For day and night, for day and night your hand was heavy upon me, my strength was dried up as by the heat of the summer. Salah. I acknowledged my sin to you, and I did not cover my iniquity. I said, I will confess my transgressions to the Lord, and you forgave the iniquity of my sin. Salah. Therefore, let everyone who is godly offer prayer to you at a time when you may be found. Surely in the rush of great waters they shall not reach him. You are a hiding place for me. You preserve me from trouble. You surround me with shouts of deliverance. Salah. I will instruct you and teach you in the way you should go. I will counsel you with my eye upon you. Be not like a horse or a mule without understanding, which must be curbed with bit and brittle, for it will stay not or it will not stay near you. Many are the sorrows of the wicked, but steadfast love surrounds the one who trusts in the Lord. 
Be glad in the Lord and rejoice, O righteous, and shout for joy, all you upright in heart. Amen. We'll have a brief moment of, si of a silent prayer of confession, and then I'll lead us through a portion of the uh, Anglican Book of Common Prayer as a general confession of sin as well. But let's pray together silently. Almighty and everlasting God, who hates nothing that you have made and forgives the sins of all those who are, that are penitent, create and make in us new and contrite hearts that we, truly lamenting our sins with unfeigned sorrow and abhorrence, and acknowledging our wretchedness with sincere resolution of amendment of life, may obtain from you, the God of all mercy, perfect remission and forgiveness, through Jesus Christ our Lord. Amen. And hear now the words of the assurance of pardon in 1 John 1, verse 9. If we confess our sins, he is faithful and just to forgive us our sins and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. Amen. Well, our next hymn is Be Still My Soul in hymn 689 of the Trinity Hymnal. Hymn 689, Be Still My Soul. Stand with me as we sing.
please be seated. I ask you to turn with me in your copy of God's Word to Mark chapter 2. Mark chapter 2, this begins the second major section in Mark's Gospel that will run to chapter 3. Uh, as far as you know, natural divisions go, Jesus is beginning to show more and more his person, not just his work, to display to the world our Lord as the living Son of God. And with those things in mind, let us now read in Mark chapter 2, verse 1 to 12. Hear now the word of God. And when he returned to Capernaum after some days, it was reported that he was at home. And many were gathered together so that there was no more room, not even at the door. And he was preaching the word to them. And they came bringing to him a paralytic carried by four men. And when they could not get near him because of the crowd, they removed the roof above him. And when they had made an opening, they let down the bed on which the paralytic lay. And when Jesus saw their faith, he said to the paralytic, Son, your sins are forgiven. Now some of the scribes were sitting there questioning in their hearts, Why does this man speak like that? He's blaspheming. Who can forgive sins but God alone? And immediately Jesus, perceiving in his spirit that they thus questioned within themselves, said to them, Why do you question these things in your hearts? Which is easier, to say to the paralytic, Your sins are forgiven, or to say, rise, take up your bed and walk. But you may know that the Son of Man has authority on earth to forgive sins. He said to the paralytic, I say to you, rise, pick up your bed and go home. And he rose and immediately picked up his bed and went out before him all, before them all, so that they were all amazed and glorified God, saying, We never saw anything like this. Let's pray together. Father, we again thank you for your word. I pray, Father, that as we consider these things in your gospel, let us see more of Christ and hear his voice and see his compassion for sinners. I pray, Father, that the very words of my mouth and meditations in my own heart will be holy and acceptable in your sight and help us all to learn more of Christ. We ask all these things in his dear name. Amen. At the seminary, we have a lot of good fun together that's not just all about studying. Um, you know, we, we have, at this time of the year, midterms, and in a couple months, we have, um, we have uh, finals as well. And with all of the, the study and things like that, you would imagine that we really don't have a lot of time to hang out together because that's all we're doing when we hang out. But the truth of the matter is we do. It's, it's a wonderful time to be able to go out with brothers and, and enjoy a meal and, and talk with one another, get to know one another better. And particularly, we're not just there to study God's Word and see the glories of Christ found in it, but we're also there to meet with Christ as well, to bear one another's burdens, and we do that each week on Thursday mornings in an hour of prayer. We meet from 11 to noon thereabouts to pray with one another and to lay our burdens down at Jesus' feet as we try to bear them one with another. And what's interesting about one instance where we were doing that, we were talking about our conversion story. We were talking about how Jesus changed our hearts and minds. And one of the things that he said, or I asked a friend of mine, uh, how were you converted? And he, how did God work in your life to draw you to himself? And he told his story and I told him mine. And one of us finally, I can't remember who, one of us finally said in the same sentiment, I remember the day I first believed. And just walking away with the knowledge that Jesus said, Son, your sins are forgiven. And that was the most free that we had ever felt. You know, I think we can all think back to our own moment where we first believed if we had made that public profession of faith and, and to know the fact that Jesus Christ has forgiven sinners. That's what he came to do. He came to display his compassion and the glory of God that we, that we may know that sinners can be forgiven. Yet there's also a reality as well. We have to ask ourselves the question, though, that even though we may be forgiven once, we still need to make it our business to seek his forgiveness every day. Because even while we might be free from sin's bondage, we are not fully free from sin's curse because 
the vestiges of sin still remain in our own hearts. And it leads us to uh, sometimes not so eagerly come to Christ. And we have to ask the question and touch the need in our own hearts is, why do we resist coming to Christ to know that, to know of that forgiveness? Why do we let sin so rule in our hearts that we would rather hang on to the bitterness, to the anger and the strife instead of being free in the forgiveness of our Lord Jesus? And at some level, and a very important level in this passage today, Jesus addresses that very question with healing the paralytic. Now we've seen Jesus already heal uh, many times. He's cast out many demons and that sort of sets the stage for the rest of his ministry as he's leading, being led by the Spirit not just in the wilderness, but ultimately to the cross, where when we lay our own sins down there, we may know of that full forgiveness. And he displays that perfectly by addressing the true need of the paralytic. Not just the fact that he's a paralytic and he does need physical healing, but he addresses the real spiritual need as well. Which reminds us then that in light of this, that Paul, rather that Mark, is teaching us that we need to come to Christ for forgiveness of sin. We need to come to Christ for forgiveness of sin. And we're going to unpack that in two ways, particularly beginning in verses 1 to 5, we're going to see our coming to Christ. And then in verses 6 to 12, we're going to see forgiven by Christ. Come to Christ, forgiven by Christ, so that we can know that we need to come to him for forgiveness of sin. Let's look again in verse 1 under that first idea of the challenges, though, that do come when we, uh, that do come, when we come to Christ. It says this in verse 1, And when he returned to Capernaum after some days, it was reported that he was at home in verse 2, and many were gathered together so that there was no room, not even at the door. Now, uh, there are times, I'm sure you've been to many concerts or you've been to maybe some political rallies or something like that, and what's the one thing that you notice when the speaker or the band members or something like that start coming down and interacting with folks? Everybody wants to get to him. I mean, I went to the... Um, I went to a, a to a rally one time a, a few years ago for a candidate, and, and you actually could see that when they came down, he was, you know, people were just striving to get to him. And I, I can't hardly imagine what would have happened had there not been some sort of security detail uh, trying to protect him. But the point being that there, there, there are crowds that gather around Jesus in the same way, that they're all pressing in on him. Now, the crowds oftentimes... You can see how the crowds are, are important in Jesus' ministry to highlight his own teaching. But in many respects, the, 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 um, the crowds oftentimes become more of a harm than a help. Because as we saw, you know, people can't, even in this own context, people are trying to get this paralytic to the Lord Jesus, but they can't do that. But Jesus has come back to Capernaum after some time doing the other things that he was doing in chapter 1, and it was reported that he was at home. Some commentators, I think, rightly say that this is most likely they're going back to Simon Peter's home because when they were in Capernaum, they were in Simon's home, and it seems that there's a definite place in which they were, and so that, for many and for me, makes a lot of sense, that they returned back to Simon Peter's home. And I, even highlighting that the fact that the crowds were even there, it says in verse 2, there was no room, not even at the door. And as we highlighted a few weeks ago, when we looked at the dimensions of Peter's house, that you know there would be a the, the entrance to the door would be really rather massive. Uh, if I remember the dimensions correctly, it would be either from this uh, post here to that post, or even from that wall to the other. So you see, like it's, it's a massive door, and perhaps even bigger than that. But the but the point of the matter is, is that. There were so many people that had, that had heard that Jesus was there, and they came in and started to collapse even on, uh, even on him in, inside and even at the door. You want to talk about standing room only at a social function or at a concert or something like that. This is one of those events. But that also poses a challenge in coming to Christ for the paralytic and for his friends. And that should cause us to take a step back and to think also about the about how churches grow and how they 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 sit back and think about you know or being drawn to a particular person or a personality or or even a movement uh, back in the 1990s there was a church growth movement led by a pastor in Chicago which ultimately was sought to address the needs of a of a seeker friendly community now 
the desire to bring the gospel to, the gospel of Christ to sinners is is well is all well and good in intention but it also should point us to the fact that crowds do not necessarily indicate God's blessing um any tack you take with evangelism or outreach or anything like that should not merely be seen for the sake of drawing the crowd. Um, you know, you look at the you look at the church. You look at some of the prosperity gospel churches, and you have to sit back and wonder if you know. We we know that the teaching of many of those prosperity ministers are, are, are is not wholly correct. And what more does it speak for them for the people that they're preaching to? If you think back in Israel's history, and particularly in the northern tribes of Israel, there were times in which there was great religious revival and spiritual fervor, particularly in the northern church, in, the, in the northern uh, in the northern tribe. But what happened, and what was the reason for why they were sent into exile? They had forgotten the true object of their worship, and they had become they had gotten to a point where they were cursed by the Lord and sent away into exile because. Of that, that that very point. So the point being that religious fervor and crowds ought not to necessarily be an indication of God's blessing, but it still should not prevent us from still coming to Christ. The second thing that we notice as well is the desperation to come. Look at verse 3, beginning in verse 3. And they came. Now that's probably either one of either the paralytic or the four men, but be that as it may, they came bringing to him a paralytic carried by four men. It says in verse 4, And when they could not get near him because of the crowd, they removed the roof above him. And when they had made an opening, they let down the bed on which the paralytic lay. And Jesus, when Jesus saw their faith, he said to the paralytic, Son, your sins are forgiven. Now you can see something of like how, how difficult it was to get in, but one of the other things that's important to note about these ancient uh, about the ancient houses in the ancient Near East, and in some ways is true even today, is that one of the things that would have, have, uh, have to be on there, or would often be on there, are stairs that would lead up to the roof on the side. You know, there wasn't any real surefire way to get up on the roof, and so they had stairs that you could be able to climb up to get onto the roof. And the roofs themselves were actually flat, covered with pitch and, and sticks and everything like that, so that you could at least walk upon it, and it had According to the book of Moses, uh, the book of the law in Moses, they had these guardrails around it as well, so that if somebody was up there that you know could potentially get themselves hurt, and on a flat roof like that, you, poss you possibly could get hurt by falling off. They put that around there so that you know, so for protection. But they were generally able to have you know wedding festivals, parties, things like that, uh, family gatherings, and the like. That was sort of the design of these of these houses with these flat roofs. And so you can sort of imagine then as they're getting up there, as these four men, potentially friends of this paralytic, as they're getting up there, they're coming up the stairs, and, and you can think about it of uh, kind of cutting a hole with this, this, this thatch and it falling down upon Jesus and everybody else to whom it was under as they sort of you know, try to guesstimate probably where Jesus is at. It's kind of like if somebody got up on our roof and started you know, cutting a hole in it uh, while, I'm, while I'm preaching or somebody else is in there, You'd probably get very, very dirty if you're wearing your Sunday bones. So, like that, that's sort of the, the situation in which they're in which they're finding themselves. But know what Jesus says. He says he saw their faith. This man perhaps was a paralytic from birth, and it doesn't describe his the nature of his own physical condition. But it is significant enough to where he has to be literally carried to Jesus because he can't take himself there. And Jesus sees that, sees their faith, the faith that Jesus can heal, and the faith of the one man that he could be able to, that who actually needed the healing to begin with. That only Christ can actually address that own physical need of healing. But Jesus sort of, in a discombobulating way, says, Son, your sins are forgiven. He calls him a son, not as though he's his own son but shows him as one who is a son of the living God. It's a term of adoption. You know, John uses that throughout his entire epistle. And he says, your sins are forgiven. Jesus cuts right to the chase. The faith that the Spirit put in them to bring them to Christ, for Christ to address not just 
the apparent, the obvious physical ailment that Jesus, that they had, but he addresses their true spiritual need as well, which is the forgiveness of sin. And that's one thing we have to draw from this is that is that Jesus addresses our truest needs. You know, it seems pretty trite and overused to say that Jesus addresses our addresses our true needs, but it is a true statement and a blessed statement as well. Because so often and throughout Mark's gospel at this point and will continue to be the case, so many come to Christ for physical healing. But Jesus is beginning here now more and more to address the true need of our own hearts, of how of our of our own true needs of forgiveness of sin. He addresses that true need because you and I were and are at one time very far from him. And he's, his spirit he plants faith in us to draw us closer to Christ such that we can actually see the fact that we have been bound in sin, we are enslaved to it, and that he has come to proclaim captives, or proclaim freedom to the captives and make the lame to walk and the deaf to hear, the blind to see, so that all may be called sons of the one true and living God. And he says to you, son, daughter, your sins are forgiven. He addresses that own particular need. But the second thing we need to learn and to see here as well is the compassion for Je of Jesus on the other hand. We need to see Jesus' compassion for sinners. It's no mistake then that, Je that we know that Jesus, uh, that Jesus is drawn near to this man for his own physical condition, his spiritual condition as well, for the faith that's been put on display. And you can't help but think that this man is, you know, in seeing this, that, that, that this man's condition and his, his spiritual state, his physical state, and Jesus is drawn to him. Because he's burdened, he's grieved, as it were, by the, by the effects of sin on this man's physical life and on his spiritual life as well. His compassion for him is just seen in the fact that he's, in, in, in addressing that spiritual, that true spiritual need, that he's doing more than what the ancient Israelites actually thought. In another instance of a healing of a paralytic, they were, they, the disciples began asking him the question, you know, who sinned, Lord, this man or his parents? Because so often what they would attribute this to is that if somebody had some sort of physical ailment, that it was as a result of sin, either by them or their parents. And so it's a sign of God's curse. And even though sometimes physical ailments and, and sicknesses and things like that can be an effect of sin, personal sin and corporate sin, Jesus is saying that's not true here. Sometimes the effects of sin are just that, effects of sin and how they affect our health. But the true need here is not the simply, again, the man's own physical ailment. And he has not done anything to get in here. But he addresses the need and is drawn to him and he says, son, by addressing him as that, he says, son, your sins are forgiven. You see the compassion of Christ. For even one of these who comes to Christ by faith can have a full, free, and full forgiveness of sin. There's also a third thing here. It's a call for us to go fervently and frequently to the Lord Jesus. It's a call to go fervently, frequently, and fully to the Lord Jesus. We, we sit back and we ask ourselves the question, why is it that we don't? And yet at the same time, I can put it to you this way. So often as we come in the midst of challenges with sin and, and the need for repentance and, and the like, so often as we come to him, we can actually know of his compassion and of his forgiveness. Sometimes we do like to hang on to the anger and the bitterness, the frustration, and everything like that from how someone maybe has sinned against us or how you may have uh, been caught in sin or anything like that. And we sort of want to hang on to it. And yet, at the same time, Christ, if we are believers, if we are sons of God, not only does he come near to us to call us to repentance, at least in this case, but uses his spirit to draw us to him. He, help, he tells us to lay our sins down at his feet to know the full of free. I mean, as sons and daughters of the king, we have the privilege of access to him, to enter into his, to his throne room, to, to but go to his throne of grace, to seek help and mercy and grace in our time of need. He opens the door wide for any of those who truly believe to come and lay our sins down at his feet. 
so that even as we sin the one time and are forgiven the one time when we believe, there's always that need and there's always that continual business to spend time with the Father. We must spend time with Him. And a lot of that comes with going to Him fervently and frequently. We can't live this life on our own. And He gives us the grace and the mercy to come to Him that we may know of His compassion and that we may know of the forgiveness of sins. But second of all, not only do we see the need to come to Christ, we also see the need to see the reality of our being forgiven by Christ. Look at verse, verses 6 through verses uh, 6 through 9. He says this, Now some of the scribes were sitting there questioning in their hearts, Why does this man speak like that? He's blaspheming. Who can forgive sins but God alone? Now that should also, also tell us something very important about what the scribes are already are uh, already seeing about him. You know, Jesus has already had some issues with the scribes at one point in Mark chapter 1, particularly, where he his teaching is one is that has authority, unlike the scribes and that of the Pharisees. But this is the first of probably many other interaction, negative interactions with the scribes, where they're starting, they're not saying it out loud, but it's pretty apparent that by Jesus saying your sins are forgiven, he's made a very, very bold claim. And they are right. They are saying that who is he? Who does he think he is to be able to forgive sins? Only God can do that. And you see sort of something of the irony too, don't you? He is God. I mean, like Mark actually tells us in chapter 1 in the first verse that this is a gospel about Jesus Christ, the Son of the living God. He is God in the flesh. He has the authority to forgive sins, as Jesus is going to say in a moment. But not only that, see also what Jesus is saying here. What's actually being said? Earlier in the week, I was reading a, I was uh, listening to a sermon on this very passage by a man named John MacArthur, who's a pastor out in California, and he was, you know, going through this and he was citing uh, a book or something like that by a man named uh, C.S. Lewis. And the thing that Lewis says in that says in the book that he's citing, you know, in an almost in an apologetic way, in a defense of Christ, he says, you know. We have three realities that we have to say about Jesus. He's either a liar, he's a lunatic, or he's Lord. Now, if Jesus claiming then to be able to forgive sins and not being able to, then he's a liar. Let alone the fact that anybody who can just prep, come in and say, you know, your sins are forgiven, he'd have to be crazy. He'd have to be something out of his mind. Unless it's true. And in that case, he would be Lord. And Jesus even displays his deity in another way, too. Look again what it says in verse 6. He says, they were sitting there questioning in their hearts. And Jesus says this in verse 8. And immediately perceiving in his spirit that they thus questioned within themselves, said to them, why do you question these things in your hearts? Not only is he showing that his ability to forgive sins, he actually shows his ability to read minds, too. Um, you know, it's actually pretty interesting that uh, with uh, with good friends and family members, um, it, it's pretty interesting to see how uh, after many years of marriage, for some of them, that they're able to basically predict and even tell what the other uh, what their spouse is going to do, and even they're able to tell you down to what they're thinking. It's actually kind of scary and, and from my vantage point, like to know that somebody could know what I'm thinking based off of how how I've acted in the past. That, that's just freaky. But Jesus is at least at one level saying something very true. I, search, I know the mind and I search the heart. Every wicked thing will be brought to light. Jesus knows what is on their hearts. And it teaches us something pretty important here as well. That we can't hide sin forever. Um, we can't hide it forever. Uh, anything that is done in secret will ultimately brought, be brought to light, and that's important for us to recognize because so often when when you look at the, when you watch TV or anything like that, and you see these cases, these murder trials or things like that, where you see a, a, a someone who's committed a crime, fully convicted of the crime and sent to prison, you're like, well, whatever it was that they did is now you know done no more. They're they're now in prison for what they've done. But sometimes those things go unpunished. We can make accusations and we can say, I know you did that. And it never go 
punished. But the truth is, even where human authorities may fail, the Word of God never will. And at the judgment bar of God, everything that is done in secret will be brought to light. If you and I believe that just by simply saying, doing, or thinking something in private, that that means nobody will ever find out, well, I mean, maybe humanly speaking, we won't, nobody will find out. But God knows because he searches the hearts and cha challenges the mind and he presses our consciences to bring it openly, fully, and honestly. That way we would know, be able to know his forgiveness. So we can't hide sin forever. But also note this, Jesus displays his authority to forgive sin as well. Jesus says in verse 9, which is easier to say to the paralytic, your sins are forgiven, or to say, rise, take up your bed and walk. But that you may know that the Son of Man has authority on earth to forgive sins. He said to the paralytic, I say to you, rise, pick up your bed and go home. Notice what Jesus is saying here. I know what's on your mind. I know what you're thinking. But which is easier? And like, let, let's ask ourselves the question, what would it be easier for Jesus to say and do here? Would it be easier for him to say, your sins are forgiven, or to say, get up, take up your mat and walk? It's actually fairly easy to say your sins are forgiven. Because at this point, by all accounts, people are, people are recognizing that Jesus is a miracle worker. But miracle workers' tricks are oftentimes discovered as well. And so sometimes if you're able to, you know, you're able to catch a magician in his trick, you're able to see, oh, well, this is a complete farce. This is, there's nothing to this. Such that if Jesus said, rise, take up your mat and walk, and it didn't come true, that would validate the whole ministry, even though, you know, Jesus could have done that. But he says, this is the reason why I said this. I want you to know that I have the authority to forgive sin. Think back to what we've said already about Jesus and his healings. We'd ask ourselves the question, is he willing? Is he able? Anything like that? Is Jesus willing to forgive sin? Yes. Is he able to forgive sin? Yes. But he's communicating something very, very distinct in this gospel at this point, that I have the authority to do so. Because I am the son of the living God. I have the authority not just to heal. I have the authority to forgive and address that true spiritual need, which is the forgiveness of sin. I have that authority. And that should be a, a simple lesson of our, of our drawing assurance from it. We should be able to draw some degree of assurance from the fact that Jesus Christ um, has the authority to forgive sin your sin, and my sin. Particularly when we believe that we're not forgiven. And that we finally sin so much that we've actually blown it. This past week, I, I listened to a song by Matt Boswell. Um, he, it was written in 2018. He's a Baptist, Southern Baptist. And he wrote a song called His Mercy is More. Uh, and I think the opening few lines actually captures the point in which Jesus is saying here. He says this, What love could remember, no wrongs we have done. Omniscient, all-knowing, he counts not their sum. Thrown into a sea without bottom or shore, our sins they are many, his mercy is more. What patience would wait as we constantly roam, what father so tender is calling us home. He welcomes the weakest, the vilest, the poor, our sins they are many, his mercy is more. Praise the Lord, his mercy is more. Stronger than darkness, new every morn, our sins they are many, his mercy is more. Jesus knows the sins of our own hearts. He knows the sin struggles that you go through every day. And you and I may go to others we've sinned against or confess sin to someone and think they could not possibly forgive us. We've all been there. But there's no conceivable way that they could forgive us. And yet we have the sure assurance 
there is any come fervently, frequently, and fully by faith to the Lord Jesus Christ, he forgives the sins of his sons and his mothers. Christ is not only able, he's not only willing, but he's ready, willing, and able, and has the authority to forgive your sins, because Christ and Christ alone has the very authority to do just that. For the glory of our triune God. That's the the reason why he does it. In verse 12, they say, we've never seen anything like this. They say that we never saw anything like this because there's never been a time where a healer has been both able to heal and claim I have the authority to forgive this sin. Human authorities may fail you, but only Christ and Christ alone can fully, freely, and also lovingly forgive your sins and remember them no more. And as the psalmist says, He can take them as far as the east is from the west. And he will not chide us forever, but he will forgive those who bring their trespasses to him. And so we need to come to Christ for forgiveness. And when we come to Christ by faith, we are forgiven by Christ fully and completely. When we think back to sharing our stories of forgiveness, knowing the freedom which comes from it, we can meditate on the knowledge that when we come to Christ as believers, He still forgives us. So I would encourage you, do not stop believing that Christ will forgive you of your sin. He does it because you are his sons. You are his daughters. You are sons and daughters of the king. And he welcomes any and all who come to him by faith to know his free and full forgiveness because he alone has the power to do that. Let us pray. Father, I thank you for your word. I thank you, Father, that indeed your mercy is more that you are our God. And I pray, Father, that we may live in the knowledge that we need you every hour. And I ask all these things in Jesus' name. Amen. Our closing hymn is hymn 674 in the Trinity Hymnal, I Need Thee Every Hour, hymn 674. Sing with me as we sing.
us pray and then I'll also pray for the food as well. Father, we do need thee every hour. I pray that even as we need you in this hour, that you will help us to remember our need for you in every hour. I pray, Father, that as we go from this place, that you will encourage us by your word and spirit. I pray that you will bless the fellowship and bless the food to our bodies, and I pray that you bless the hands that prepare it. Now go with us as we go, and we ask all these things in Jesus' dear name. Amen. Go in peace.